A warm welcome to CV African News and thank you for always joining us. This is Africa Today. My name is Najima Luima. But first are the headlines. COVID infections dates drop in Uganda hospitals. Police to deploy 160 officers to Somalia. Kenya rejects court ruling over border dispute with Somalia. And in sports, forwards Mwawu Mpanga among new recruits at Gaddafi Football Club. I will welcome once again now the news in detail. The number of COVID-19 infections and dates has continued to decline with only an average of 124 cases and six dates being reported per day, according to the Ministry of Health. We have more. Statistics from the Health Ministry indicates that at the peak of the COVID-19 second wave in June this year, the country registered as high as 1,445 cases per day and 57 virus deaths were being registered daily. This implies a 91% decline in COVID-19 cases and a 89% decline in pandemic-related deaths when compared three months ago in June. Health Minister Ruth Acheng yesterday said that although there is a general decline in COVID-19 numbers, some regions are registering increased transmission. She said the threat of third wave of the pandemic is imminent. Dr. Cheng said in their analysis that more females have been infected with COVID-19 in the second wave than males unlike in the first wave. She said the high COVID-19 infection rates among women are because the, the majority who attend barriers and go to public places, linking the practice to increased risk of contracting the infections. The hotspot districts include Kampala City in central Uganda, Soroti, Katakwe, Ngora, Karachi in Teso sub-region, Amuru, Gulu, and Noha in Achori sub-region, and Oyam district in Lango sub-region. The increased transmission, Dr. Cheng said, is being driven by mass gathering at barriers and weddings, congestions at city centers, and failure to follow COVID-19 preventative measures. Dr. Cheng said 61% of those who died in COVID-19 treatment units had comorbidities such as hypertension, diabetes and HIV. Plans are underway to deploy a total of 160 Uganda police officers in Somalia to help build capacity of the Somali police. The team is part of the formed police unit who on Wednesday completed a six-month intensive pre-deployment training course in peacekeeping operations of African Union mission in Somalia, Amisom. The officers during their training at Chigo were assessed by a team of five formed police assessment officers led by ASP Figalo Maxim from the AMISOM headquarters. In Somalia, the officers will provide public order management, protection of African Union personnel and facilities within means and capabilities and support police operations that require a formed response. Uganda is one of AMISOM police contributing countries whereas others include Sierra Leone, Zambia, Kenya, Nigeria, and Ghana. The UN Security Council authorized AMISOM to deploy up to 1,040 police personnel under the police component, which includes individual police officers and five FPUs. Whereas the formed police unit personnel provide operational support such as VIP escort and protection, the individual police officers train, mentor, and advise the Somali police officers. Uganda deployed the first formed police unit in Somalia under AMISOM in July 2012 after the UPDF had deployed there earlier on in 2007. Units have rotated on an annual basis and the deployment of the latest unit will make the 10th rotation of Uganda's formed police unit in Somalia under the African Union. Today, 14th October 2021, Uganda joins the rest of the world in commemoration of the International Standards Day with a theme, Our Shared Vision for a Better World, aimed at acknowledging the immense contribution of experts and stakeholders involved in championing development, promoting and enforcing implementation of standards in various sectors of the economies worldwide. 
Speaking to the press today at the Uganda Media Center, Mr. David Livingstone Eberu, the Executive Director of Uganda National Bureau of Standards, said that these experts are drawn from within the standards bodies, private sector, policymakers, and academia. However, globally, the private sector drives standardization agenda, including sponsoring the development of standards for application in specific sectors. Mr. David Livingstone added that since the standards affect our daily life from the clothes we wear to the food we eat, Uganda National Bureau of Standards is calling upon the general public, especially those involved in manufacturing, distribution and sale of products regulated under mandatory standards, to have them certified by the Uganda National Bureau of Standards before putting them on market so that their safety and performance be granted for the consumers. In line with the national sub-theme of building back post-COVID-19, the role of standards, the Uganda National Bureau of Standards as a key promoter of Buy Uganda Build Uganda policy aimed at import substitution and exports promotion has decided to subsidize the cost of implementing standards to enable the private sector build back better and bigger post-COVID-19. Let's take a very quick short break. We will be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching TV African News, The Right to Know. Kenya's President Uhuru Kenyatta has rejected a ruling by the UN's top court which allows Somalia to take control of most of a potentially oil and gas rich chunk of the Indian Ocean. The ruling on Tuesday comes after a dispute between the two countries over the issue. Uhuru Kenyatta said that while Kenya is not surprised by the decision, it is profoundly concerned by the import of the decision and its implications for the Horn of Africa region and international law generally. He added that at the very onset, Kenya wished to indicate that it rejected in totality and did not recognize the findings in the decision. Like their president, some Kenyan residents appear disappointed at the court ruling. Many nationals say that they were not really pleased as Kenyans because their territory has been taken away from them, adding that their government is very steadfast and are going to defend their border. Other Kenyans who offered anonymity said that this is the right time for Kenyans to defend their government, Kenya's territory and boundaries, because when they decide to give them an inch, they will take definitely a mile. The judges unanimously ruled there was no agreed maritime boundary in force, and drew a new border close to one claimed by Somalia. The leader of the Western Sahara Independence Movement said the fighting with Morocco will continue between a long wall cutting through Africa's vast desert until the international community delivers on an unfulfilled promise of self-determination for Salawi people. The United Nations considers Western Sahara as Africa's last territory to be decolonized, but its envoys have failed to set the stage for a referendum on its future since a ceasefire was signed 30 years ago between Morocco, which had annexed it in 1975 on the independence-seeking Polisario Front. The conflict has received a renewed attention with the flowering of violence as a result of growing frustration frustration among the Sahrawi, but also as the United States late last year disregarded the UN efforts by backing Morocco's sovereignty over the entire disputed territory. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has recently appointed a new special envoy to Western Sahara. In a rare public appearance following a long convalescence for COVID-19 earlier this year, Polisario Front leader Brahim Ghali on Tuesday defended his movement's decision in November 2020 to call off the 1991 ceasefire. 
hostilities have remained at a relatively small scale, although Polisario officials told the media that at least eight of its soldiers have died in combat or retreating from attacks launched on Moroccan army positions along the wall. But the conflict could escalate and destabilize the northern African region, Gali said in a veiled reference to worsening relations between Morocco and Algeria in recent months. Algeria has sheltered Salawi refugees since Rabat's annexation of their homeland. The Salawi have become a minority in the Moroccan-controlled part of the territory where authorities have incentivized the establishment of Moroccan settlers. Cape Verde is geared towards the next general election scheduled on October 17th, with the outgoing President George Carlos Fonseca having indicated that the runoff will take place on October 31st. The presidential decree setting the dates for the runoff was issued on July 27 and went into effect immediately, although the schedule has been under discussion since January 2021. The municipal elections were held in October 2020 and legislative elections in April this year. Already the head electoral commission, Alinda Shantri, has granted a free and fair poll even as the preparations continue. Cape Verde's largest political parties, the African Party for Independence of Cape Verde and the Movement for Democracy, nominated Jose Maria Neves and Carlos Vaiga respectively. These parties have great historical and political strength in Cape Verde and have largely dominated the country's political scene for nearly three decades. Jose Maria Neves, who is a former Cape Verdean Prime Minister, who was elected three times between 2001 and 2016, is touted to win this election. He has also had several political positions, such as President of his party and National Deputy. In the last presidential elections held on October 2, 2016, constitutionalist George Carlos Fonseca of Movement for Democracy was re-elected with 74% of the vote. At the end of this second term, the president cannot be re-elected under the country's term limit rules. The new army chief in Burkina Faso has promised a new strategy in the fight against terrorism. Gilbert Odraugo took office on Tuesday as the new chief of general staff of the armed forces, promising a new approach to deal with extremist violence in the country. The presidential decree setting the dates for the runoff was issued on July 27 and went into effect immediately, although the schedule has been under discussion since January 2021. The municipal elections were held in October 2020 and legislative elections in April this year. Already the head electoral commission, Alinda Shantri, has granted a free and fair poll even as the preparations continue. Cape Verde's largest political parties, the African Party for Independence of Cape Verde and the Movement for Democracy, nominated Jose Maria Neves and Carlos Vaiga respectively. These parties have great historical and political strength in Cape Verde and have largely dominated the country's political scene for nearly three decades. Jose Maria Neves, who is a former Cape Verdean Prime Minister, who was elected three times between 2001 and 2016, is touted to win this election. He has also had several political positions, such as president of his party and national deputy. In the last presidential elections held on October 2, 2016, constitutionalist George Carlos Fonseca of Movement for Democracy was re-elected with 74% of the vote. At the end of this second term, the president cannot be re-elected under the country's term limit rules. Let's once again take a very quick short break. We will be right back. In our business news today, the Virunga National Park is more famous for its gorillas. But despite the lack of infrastructure, an unlikely business has sprouted where the Renzori Mountains guard the border with Uganda a chocolate factory. Virunga Oregon's chocolates processes cocoa from local producers 
to prevent smuggling across the border. It tries to show a different life is possible away from conflict. According to Roger Muhindo, production head at Virunga Origins Chocolates, the big challenge of all was learning the trade, what chocolate is, how to make chocolate, and then getting good at it. In less than a year, more than 200 civilians have been killed within a 20 kilometer radius of the factory, which has led to many farmers abandoning their fields. Soldiers arrived in May after President Felix Shisekedi decreed a state of emergency to try and stop the violence, although the killings continue in remote rural zones. Anthony Marushai, spokesman for the Congolese Army's Operation Sokola 1, against the ADF in Beni, said that they deploy small units everywhere to protect people in their fields. The Virunga Park's hydroelectric plant in the Renzori foothills started operations in 2013. It provides power to Mutwanga and there is hope it will attract more business. The chocolate factory has 10 full-time employees, including four widows of park rangers. The factory is expanding to meet international demand. It will then put out 10 times more chocolate. In our health news today, campaigners in Zimbabwe have been trying to persuade hesitant members of apostolic church groups to get vaccinated against COVID-19 amid pervasive disinformation. According to campaigner Yvonne Binder, the issue of vaccination is a very big challenge where people receive misleading information, especially from social media about vaccination. Binda and her colleague Alexander Chipfunde spoke to a congregation dressed in pristine white robes in Seke, some 40 kilometers from Halari, telling them not to believe what they have heard about COVID-19 jabs. Apostolic groups that infuse traditional beliefs into a Pentecostal doctrine are among the most skeptical in Zimbabwe when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines with an already strong mistrust of modern vaccine. Many apostolic churches followers put faith in prayer, holy water and anointed stones to ward off disease or cure illnesses. The conservative groups adhere to a doctrine demanding that followers avoid medicines and medical care and instead seek healing through their faith. More than 80% of Zimbabweans identify as Christian according to the National Statistics Agency but there is no one-size-fits-all solution to convincing hesitant religious citizens to get vaccinated. Zimbabwe has fully vaccinated 15% of its population, much better than many other African nations, but still way behind the US and Europe. Addressing an audience of churchgoers on Sunday, the country's deputy health minister hailed the economic benefits of getting jabbed. In our sports news today, management of newly promoted Uganda Premier League entity Gaddafi Football Club confirmed their new squad for the 2021-2022 season. Tried and tasted a forward, Faizo Mwawu is among the new players at the Jinja-based entity. Kajanchu reports. Mwawu became a free agent as his employment contract at Sports Club Villa came to an end at the end of June 2021 after a two-year tenure. He thus marks a return to Jinja, having also played at Kirinya Jinja Senior Secondary School, now Soga United, having also trained briefly at Bull Football Club. The aggressive centre forward has also been previously employed at Inkumba University at regional and federation for Uganda Football Association's big league levels, Nyam Tiogora, as well as Sowana, now Toro United. He has also played for Uganda National Beach Soccer Team Sand Cranes, as well as the 2015-2016 Uganda Beach Soccer League champions, Isabet. 
He reunites with the former Kumba University teammate, goalkeeper Ronald Mutebi, who was signed from Maroons. Mutebi has also been at Saltillo Bright Stars and Express Football Clubs. In the same vein, the club acquired forward Sulampanga from Vipers on a season-long loan deal as well as Brian Kalumba. Kalumba had also spent the 2020-2021 season on loan at Uganda People's Defence Forces Football Club. That was the news. Thank you for always tuning in to TV Africa. Please do stay tuned. The more programming coming your way.